Hi, everybody. Hi. God is great. Thank you, Jesus. Hi. Hi, Ostia. Hi, Charmaine. <sighs> Hi, Clayton. Hi, Glinda. Hi, Tay. Hi, Angie. Hi. Um, hi. Hi, Mom. Hi. Hello. How are you? I hope everybody is doing really good. Um, hi, Ashita. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, everyone. I pray you all are doing well. Thank you, Jesus. I pray everyone had a blessed day. Hi, um, Sister Terry. Hi, Georgia. I hope everyone is doing well. Hi, Faye. How are you? Hi, Sweba. Hi, Allie. Let's bring this mic a little closer. Okay. Hi, Janique. Amen. Amen. Sorry, y'all. That's good. I'm excited to teach it. I pray that it helps all of us with understanding, you know, maybe sometimes why certain things happen to us or even beginning to start repenting, not just for our sins, but for some of the sins that are connected to our bloodline so that we can be free from whatever attacks would come on our bodies or um, whatever we would reap in return for some of the things that we've done. Hi, um, Jessica. Oh, amen. I'm so glad that you've been enjoying them. I've been enjoying teaching them. So that is awesome. Okay, it's almost time. Hi. Oh, amen, definitely. Hi, Denise. 
Glory to God. Glory to God. All right. I'm going to um, get into prayer so that we can start this lesson. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you so much for blessing us with another day. Thank you for how good and how awesome and how faithful you are. We just thank you so much, Lord, for oh, your faithfulness, your provision, your love all over our lives, Lord God. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for keeping us. We thank you for keeping our families. We thank you that we are in our right minds, God. We thank you that we are still hungry for your word and that we are seeking your face, Lord Jesus. We thank you for these teachings, Father. We thank you for the conviction. We thank you for the insight. We thank you for the knowledge. We thank you for the spiritual maturity and growth. Thank you so much, Lord God, for meeting us here night after night. I'm asking that you would cover this broadcast with the blood of Jesus, cover this live stream with the blood of Jesus, cover each and every one of us, cover our homes and everyone in our homes with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. I cancel every satanic attack against this live stream, against the people who are listening to this message um, in Jesus' name. I cancel every attack that would come through the laptop, through the tablet, through the Wi-Fi, or any other uh, portal or means in the name of Jesus. I seal it shut with the blood of Jesus. And I just loose your peace upon all of us, God, as this goes forth in the name of Jesus. Let it go forth with authority. Let it go forth with understanding. Please, Father, in the name of Jesus, allow counsel, wisdom, understanding, knowledge, and revelation to rest upon us all, Lord Jesus. And I pray for each and every person who's listening, that you would continue this conversation, continue this lesson, continue to teach them, Lord, continue to connect things for them in the name of Jesus, even after this live stream ends in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to come to true repentance. Help us to be knowledgeable concerning sin and the areas where we are missing the mark things that we didn't even think of or know about in the name of Jesus. Give us answers concerning why some of us are battling with sicknesses and diseases and various cycles within our lives in Jesus's name. Lord, we love you. We honor you. And we ask that you would teach this lesson. And we say, speak, Lord, because your servants are listening. And it's in Jesus's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. And amen. I am so happy that you all are ready for this lesson. I am too. Uh, if I'm just going to be honest with you, the Lord keeps giving me scriptures. So that's why you see me with my, like my head right here. Um, give me just one second. Almost ready, y'all. Thank you for your patience. I'm coming. I promise within the next minute we're going to be going. Okay. Perfect. I'm ready. Okay. So um, thank you all for being on. Thank you so much for your patience with me. Hi, Antonique. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm turning off the chat, right? Wait, let me get the comment off the screen. Now I'm going to turn off the chat so that we can actually get into, oh, you all, you know what? I wasn't even going to wear this. I had like something else that I was going to wear on camera, but I wanted to wear this living epistle shirt because I said it was the shirt of the month. Okay. Let me move the microphone. And let me hope that my camera doesn't move. But do we see this? It says living epistle. It has like the lifelines, the Bible here. It's a cool shirt. It was, it's the shirt of the month for March. Okay. We'll have a different one next month, but I decided to wear it because I'm like, Hey, they haven't seen this one yet. So this one is gray and lavender. I would just say, be careful. If you choose to order, order the shirt with the color that you choose to get because I got this shirt in gray also, but the color 
the um, print color was gray and blue instead of gray and lavender, and it actually did not show up. And I really need to return it. I really do. The return process, to my understanding, is really simple. But either way, I wanted to show y'all that. I'm really happy with this shirt. I, I love the design of the shirt. Of course, I made the design, you know, me and Jesus, me and Jesus. Um, but yeah, so I figured since this is one of the final lessons for the month that it's very befitting for me to put this on since it is the shirt of the month. All right, we are going to get into the lesson. And thank you, Jesus. Okay. So we understand what our base scripture is. It's Genesis 4 and 7. Genesis 4 and 7. We're reading the New Living Translation. It says, you will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Okay, so we learned, to, we learned, we've learned so much this week about sin, about salvation, being born again. We've learned so much this week that is so difficult for me to even do justice with a recap, man. But we learned that sin is something that is subtle. It's not just something that we do. It's an actual entity. As God said to Cain, sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. And we don't just see this in Old Testament, but we also see this in New Testament where we can present our bodies to sin as instruments of unrighteousness and that sin can reign. And that word is like, be the Lord or be the King over our mortal bodies. So we learned so much about sin. It's difficult for me to even go over everything, but if you have not seen all of the messages for this week, I highly recommend that you do watch the other messages so that you can get like a full spectrum of everything that we've talked about. We've talked about how sin enters in. We've talked about how sin enslaves us. We've talked about the origins of sin. And now we're going to talk about how sin affects the body. Okay. Sin has an effect on the body. So let's see. One good example of that is the fact that when sin entered into humanity, death also entered into humanity. OK, so that's a direct result of sin. The fact that, um, you know, people have to die. So I'm going to get into this lesson, how sin affects your bloodline, how sin affects your bloodline, how sin affects your body. So we understand that when we go to a doctor's office, they want to know our family history because usually they would know what to uh, tell us to watch out for or what recommendations to give us, because if they know things about our family, then they pretty much can understand things about our bodies. If they know about our family's health, our family's mental health, our family's longevity, then they will be able to know all about us. It's the same way spiritual, unless we are born again, we inherit things from our family. Sin has an effect on the bloodline. And sometimes these effects are physical. And we understand that sin brings violence, sin brings curses, uh, sin brings immorality, and sin also brings sickness into the bloodline. So let's get started here. Mixing wasn't was not prohibited in Israel because something was genetically wrong with non-Hebrews, okay? They were regular human beings, just like Hebrews were. God created them all, and the Hebrew nation started when a person, a part of a heathen nation, turned to serve one God, okay? So they all came from heathens, basically. Everybody was, until Abram decided to listen to the voice of God. Amen. So uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. There was, however, something wrong with their worship practices and the object of their worship. Those are the things that God did not want mixed with his people. He even created laws to introduce the people he set apart to the reality that some things were wrong, unacceptable to him, and if they were practiced, they would have great and irreversible and sometimes ongoing consequences. 
So it's not that something, you know, was genetically wrong with, um, we would say with non-Hebrews during that time. The issue was their form of worship. That made them unclean. It was their form of worship. It was the things that they partook in. It was the things that they believed. It was who they were worshiping that made them unclean. It made them sinful. So God set Israel and his children apart. And he says, listen, you can't do this, that, don't eat that thing. Stay away from blood. You know, um, don't touch this. Don't worship that. Don't wear this because God was introducing his people to the fact that, listen, I'm holy. I'm not, you know, you can't worship me any old kind of way. There's even a scripture where he says, don't worship me the way they worship their gods. OK, God is holy and he set apart. So if God is going to call a people to himself, those people have to be set apart, too. And God has standards. So we understand what it means to be set apart. And what God wants us to do is to meet those standards, because if we don't, we miss the mark. And so when we sin or when we fall into the ways that heathens or non-believers live, then we inherit certain sin, um, certain consequences because of those sins. Some of those consequences are sickness within the body. Matthew 24 and 12. Matthew 24 and 12, it says, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. Now this is speaking about the end times and the result of sin is a lack of love. But what we see here is that sin is rampant everywhere, but can I make this, this statement that sickness is also rampant? That there have never been so many people sick with uh, diseases, various viruses. Um, things are just on the rise as far as sickness goes. There have never been so many people on prescription drugs. There have never been so many people struggling with mental illness than now during a time when sin is rampant. This is one of the realities that we need to just, you know, uh, understand that when people sin, one of the consequences is sickness, okay? It's a direct result a lot of the times of sickness. Now, there is a scripture where Jesus is speaking to someone and he says, the sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. So there are some times where God, where God will allow us to become sick for his glory, for a greater testimony, um, to get our attention or something like that. However, what we will see in scripture is that he said that to someone one time. Most of the other times, it was a direct result possibly of their actions or the actions of their loved ones. So let's see. When Adam sinned, okay, wait, I wanna read this scripture because it's gonna make sense out of what I'm about to say. Taking you prisoners. Okay, here we go. I'm just going to read the whole thing. It's kind of long, so I was trying to... Okay, it's right at the beginning. Romans 7 and 14. It says, for we know the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, sold into sin's power. Okay, so scripture says that humanity has been sold. Anyone who's made from flesh has been sold into the power of sin. So this gives us more insight of sin and its relationship to humans. When Adam sinned, he didn't just perform an act of disobedience. Adam actually made a transaction. He sold his race, his bloodline, or his children into sin, or he sold them over to sin, almost like slaves, like how you would sell. He sold his bloodline over to sin. According to scripture, we are sold into sin's power. And we understand that that goes back to the garden. So Adam didn't just perform an act of disobedience. He made a transaction. He sold his bloodline to sin. The transaction is essentially, if you let me in if you let me inside of you, you can do what you want. Now, if you don't want me inside of you, then continue to obey God and be restricted. But if you allow me in, 
then you can do whatever you want. You can indulge in all of your desires. It doesn't matter how wicked it is. It doesn't matter how depraved it is. It doesn't matter how strange it is. It doesn't matter how unnatural or ungodly it is. If you let me in, then I'll let you do this thing. Okay. So this was the transaction. And so Adam sold the freedom of himself and his offspring to be served by sin or to allow uh, and to become slaves to sin. He knew the price would be death because God told him and he was still willing to pay the price, not truly understanding how far reaching death would be. Can you really have a concept of death? If you've never seen it, never experienced it. But not only did his actions cause the death of humanity, it also caused every the death of every created thing on this earth. Everything at some point on this planet has to die. And that's because sin has entered in. So God is after our bloodline through righteousness. And the enemy is after our bloodline through sin. This is why it's essential that we become saved and that we raise our children up in the Lord because God has so many blessings. And when he blesses someone, we can look over scripture. He doesn't just bless that person. It's always for their bloodline. Even in the book of Acts, when he talks about this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he says, this is for your children and your children's children. And, um, you know, the future generations and as many as the Lord will call. God doesn't just want to bless us. He wants to bless our bloodline. Why? Because uh, the enemy, the devil, Lucifer himself, Satan, is after our bloodline and he uses sin to capture our bloodline. And the thing is, sin is something that is innately at work within our physical bodies until we choose to serve God. And so that's why when we have our families, God is like, I want to bless your whole family. Turn to me, inherit blessings. I will redeem you from every curse. OK, you and your family don't have to be sick. You and your family don't have to struggle. You and your family don't have to go through this thing or the next thing. Come to me. God is after our bloodline and the way he captures us is through our righteous behavior. When we choose to say, you know what, I'm turning from sin and I'm going to do whatever Jesus tells me to do. And the enemy is after our bloodline through sin. The enemy wants us to continue to live in sin. He wants us to continue to live in unrighteousness. He wants us to indulge in whatever we indulge in, because if we continue to do that, then he'll have rights to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And I'll use some scripture to support this. Who we choose to allow to live within us and what we choose to uphold will absolutely affect our bloodlines. If you're a witch and you do witchcraft, trust me, your children will be bound. Your children will be bound with sickness. Your children will be bound with poverty. Your children will be bound with uh, mental illness. Your children will be bound with a whole bunch of uh, various things as well as torment from the devil if you were a witch, okay? Because you sold your bloodline over to wickedness. That's what it has to any witch that may be watching. You don't have to be a witch, you really don't. The devil has lied to you and made you believe that maybe you don't have a way out or you have to do this. But if you don't turn from wickedness, you will go to hell. Absolutely. But as long as there is breath in your body, God can still do something with your life. And God is always, always, always was, always will be more powerful than Satan. OK, so whatever powers you're working for, they are controlled and in submission to the devil. Trust me. I mean, um, to God, excuse me. I saw this former witch saying that she used to meet with Satan and she began to become frustrated because she said she realized that he was not able to do everything that she wanted him to do. He was not able to empower her to do everything. She, he, it's like he was limited in subject and some people and some things he couldn't do anything against. And so she said, I began to get frustrated with him because I found out he ain't even got all that power that he fronting like he has. Y'all, we give him the power when we give into sin and then we believe his lies. And he's a good liar. He was a liar from the beginning. He was a sinner from the beginning. But don't allow him to keep you bound. You don't have to be bound. You have authority over the devil, 
over all of his power and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Operate in your authority and you have to live right. Got to get that heart right. Got to get yourself right before the Lord. Got to take him serious because this war that we're in is real. But the enemy is after our bloodline. Just like the father is after our bloodline. He doesn't just want to bless you. He wants to bless your children and your children's children. Hallelujah. So if we are righteous, but someone in our bloodline chooses unrighteousness, um, sin and curses of sin enter. So that means if, you know, someone chooses to live for the Lord and they're in church 24 hours a day and they are praying and they're laying hands on their children and they're anointing their child, that child still has a free will choice to either serve God or serve the devil. OK, y'all, I am just very, very saddened by Glorilla. I am because I remember feeling led by the Lord to see her in a particular interview. In that interview, she said that she was in church about five or six days out of the week. She said she was homeschooled. She didn't have any friends. She didn't know any outside children outside of the church. Her name is literally Gloria hallelujah and whatever her last name is and i heard her say her middle name out of her own mouth okay because i didn't believe it i'm like ain't no way but yes way her family were they were devoutly religious people okay devoutly her mom was devoutly religious took her children to um church and didn't even allow them in public school she wanted to teach them herself but from one situation to another she had to put her children in public school and um, that's when uh, Glorilla says that they learned uh, a different way of life. And she said that was it. She was out. It didn't matter how righteous her mother was. OK, she made a choice. OK, and I have been praying for her so hard that she would not turn and sell her soul, that she would not indulge, that she would feel conviction, that she would be protected. But um, what can you do? What can you do? I knew some people who were signed to a, a major record label. Their mom uh, was also devoutly religious. Now, this record label, um, it was headed off by somebody like Pub Daddy. I'll put it like that, right? And the, the mom said that one night she had this vision or this dream or something, and she said, she saw her children being led down this dungeon-like spiral staircase. And um, she said it was all red. And she said it was like coffins and some type of crazy stuff going on down there. And she understood that it was rituals that they would want her children to partake in to be uh, really famous in that industry. And so she told her um, children, she said, listen, y'all got to give it up now. You have to give it up right now. Okay. Because this is what God showed me. And I tell you, this was before anybody was really talking about selling souls and things of that nature. And her children listened to her and they turned away from the industry. And now one is a bishop and one is an elder in the church. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. But you know, if someone is righteous, you can be righteous as you want to be. If you're, if um, you, if one of your children or your grandchildren or great grandchildren, if they choose to serve Satan, then right there, they kind of change the trajectory of the bloodline. Okay, they've changed their object of worship. They changed their moral standards, and they've invited something unclean and polluted and perverted into something that was pure. OK, so if someone is unrighteous and someone in their bloodline chooses righteousness, we inherit eternal life, but still have to listen, actively break the curses, the covenants and contracts sin has with our ancestors to walk in total deliverance. So it's all up to us what we choose. But if we choose to live righteous and we know we've had some unrighteous grandparents, parents, aunts, uncles and all that stuff, but we choose Jesus, then we also have to know that now that we have chosen the Lord and we decide that we want to submit to him and we are operating according to his power, we have to be conscious about actively breaking the curses and the covenants and the contracts that sin has with our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. Okay. You know, 
if, if your grandparents were into incest, if they were into drunkenness, if they were into witchcraft, you have to, as a Christian now, say, I sever every covenant, every contract, and every curse connected to my bloodline. Every one of those spiritual agreements that my ancestors made with the devil or with certain spirits, I sever myself from those things now. OK, because it's not that you won't be saved. It's just that you may go through things that would have been avoidable if you knew about those curses or whatever particular issues uh, were in the past of your family, of your bloodline, of your history. OK, and for me personally, I've repented for things all the way back to pre-slavery, because if you think that them, them major demons that they were worshiping and still worship today don't have anything to do with the current state of the black community, then honey, I don't know what to tell you, but I know one thing, poverty, immorality, murder, sickness, and all that stuff, all those things are curses. So God says that he will curse the, the generations and revisit the iniquity upon people who do witchcraft and worship other gods to the third and fourth generations of those who hate him. So yes, I have repented back for all that stuff. Have y'all seen real African voodoo where voodoo was started in West Africa where the slaves come from? Have y'all seen inanimate objects get up and move and start dancing? Because I have. That's some real witchcraft. And the sick part is now the younger community would rather worship those demons because they say, and I've heard them say it out their own mouths, that first of all, it's their heritage, it's their culture, but they say it's more power in that than in the church. Anyway, when they do it, they're reviving curses and they're keeping the curses going. Curses and covenants and spiritual contracts and binding agreements that their ancestors had with these demons Honey, if we don't get wise and start breaking that stuff, a whole bunch of us may start getting into divination, think it's cute to play with crystals and wear that stuff, think it's cute to wear our hair in a certain type of way, think it's cute to open up our third eye and all that stuff that they, I hear taught among Christian people. Christian people who other people allow to lay hands on them. This is where we at. And we don't understand that when we do these things, not only are we corrupting ourselves, we are corrupting our children. The devil is not just going to stop at you and say, oh, I'm going to leave your kids alone. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Just like the father wants to bless your uh, bloodline from generation to generation. The enemy wants to curse your bloodline from generation to generation. The enemy wants to snuff out strong bloodlines. So he would need there to be discord. He would need marriage to be perverted. He would need for abortions to be on the rise. He would need for immorality to be on the rise. And for those who choose to go to church, he would need for there to be secularism and worldliness in the church. Please, he says he, he wants pollution in the bloodline somehow, some way. So there were years ago, decades ago, where there were people, they would call them big mama, people, grandmothers, mother boy, mother stacks. You wouldn't dare see them with no jewelry on, no pants on. You know what I'm saying? They was preaching holiness. They was preaching against sin. They were, it, it was no such thing as, you know, mixing in these things. But when you just allow a little leaven in, when you allow a little bit of leaven in, a little bit of error. When you allow a little bit of things to go unchecked, this is sin. What does the Bible compare sin to? Leaven or yeast. Have we ever baked anything? Baked some bread? You put a little bit of yeast. You can have about four cups of flour in a bread recipe. You put about a tablespoon and a half. That whole lump of dough will rise. And that's what the Bible says sin is like. When we chose to ignore just a little bit of things, we allowed a little bit of sin in and guess what? It just crept in. So now the things that used to be normal decades ago are told, are, we're told we shouldn't even do those things no more. Those things don't matter. And those, even if those things are rooted in scripture, this is a perverted generation. Why? Because of sin, but it's what we are choosing to do. We are choosing 
to adhere to sin. We are choosing to say these things don't matter that used to matter and God doesn't care about certain things. This is what we are choosing. Listen, when we understand that we are Christians and we have come into this great covenant with God, we have to break those old covenants that our ancestors had with the devil. We have to break those old contracts that we had, that some of us have with the devil. How many of us um, were cursed ourselves when we were in the world? We got to break those curses. Amen. Amen. Come on now. Some of us said, I will never do this. Or if I don't do this by this age, I'm not going to do it. Um, or if I don't happen to, you know, get into this by that age, then it's never going to happen for me. I heard a preacher saying that she would always say when she was a teenager that by the time she got to 40, she was going to die. She said she thought 40 was really old. And she said, I'm not living past 40. And she said, as soon as she hit 39, she started to get sick. And she had... Um, if her blood levels were supposed to be at about 12 or 13, they went down to somewhere between five and seven. And the doctor said, you shouldn't even be like able to walk in here right now. I'm sending you to get a blood transfusion. And she said they were never able to find a cause for her sickness. She said she was weak and she said that she prayed and she asked the Lord, why is this happening to me? And he said, you made a vow. You made a vow that you weren't going to live to this age. So we have to understand that even when we come to Christ, some people think, oh, now that I'm Christian, nothing is supposed to bother me. Nothing's supposed to happen against me. That's not true. He said, you made a vow. You have to break that vow. Death and life is in the power of your, your tongue. Listen, the Bible says, I decree a thing. It is established. She had to break that vow and that covenant that she had with death. OK, and she's still alive today. Glory to God. Um, several years later, but she had to break that vow with death. So just because you're a Christian, don't think, oh, that doesn't matter. That was pre that was, you know, pre Christ. Pre -Christ. That's OK. Whatever came out your mouth, whatever you thought up in your heart, that thing was spiritual. You made a contract. If it wasn't right and if it was against the will of God, there were some demons that connected themselves to that thing. And you gave them the authority to work it out and cause it to materialize. So, yes. I'm here to tell you, even if you're saved, go break them curses, break those covenants, break those vows, break those contracts that either you had with sin or your ancestors had with sin or that you had against yourself or your ancestors had against you. OK, maybe they said nobody in my bloodline, none of my family ever can do something like this or my family never does this or my family never makes it past this point. We have the ability through Jesus to overcome all of that. Do y'all hear me? We do not have to fall into the curses of our bloodline. It's just plain good old knowledge and coming out of it, trusting the Lord. Amen. And knowing uh, what his will is for your life and his will for your life is not premature death. It's not sickness. You think Jesus went through all those stripes and gave us scripture that tells us in the Old Testament, in New Testament, by his stripes, we were healed because he wants us to be sick. You think he got the flesh ripped up off of him because he wants you to be sick? Absolutely not. As Christians, we have some rights. And when we see those rights being violated, we need to find out why it's happening and we don't need to normalize it. And we need to aggressively pursue whatever is attempting to overrule the truth of God or exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Because the knowledge of God would tell every demon that this saint does, is not supposed to have sickness in their body. So if you know that you've broken all those covenants and this, that, and the third, and your heart is pure and all of that, and you living right and you still going through something, now it's time to start casting down and going to war because something is violating what is rightfully yours. Healing and health is rightfully yours. We're going to get into all of these scriptures. Let me tell y'all, we are already 38 minutes in. So y'all know this is going to be longer than an hour, right? All right. Thank, thank you for wanting to hang out with me. <laughs> thank you. So sin can result in sickness in the individual and sometimes in their children. Just because someone has a sickness, it doesn't mean they are actively in sin. It could be something done for God's glory. It could be for a past um, some sin that they committed in their past, or it could be something linked to them generationally. If you know um, your, your daddy got heart problems and 
cancer run on that side of the family, you need to start breaking covenants right now as you're listening to this message. And then when it's over, continue to do it with cancer, with heart issues, start pleading the blood of Jesus over yourself, start renouncing it, pray and fast against it, say, absolutely not. You will not enter my body. Whatever you were planning to do at whatever time in my life you were planning to do it, I cancel it now. My heart belongs to God. My temple belongs to God. Cancer, you have no right to set up shop in my body. I command you to dry up now every root of cancer. And I'm gonna tell y'all this, and I'm just gonna put this here. Sometimes God will tell you to eat a certain type of way. He has his own ways of healing however he wants to heal a person, okay? He can do it however he wants to do it. Jesus called healing on people because he wanted to. He spit, put some mud together with his spit, mixed it with dirt, healed somebody's eyes that way because that's what he wanted to do. So sometimes he will tell you, listen, I want you to stop doing this thing. That may be the legal right that they have to destroy the body. The Bible says that if any man destroys his body, God will destroy that man. And maybe God is saying, I want you to start putting your body back together again because you've opened some doorways for sickness for yourself. So I need you to stop eating that. I need you to start eating this. You know how many people who aren't even believers turned away from um, certain things. There's this man, he's in his 50s. That man looked like he about in his 30s, okay? He was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He said, I was not about to um, suffer the way they told me I was gonna suffer. I was not going to live with erectile dysfunction. I was not gonna have this sickness in my body. So he said, I did my own research. The man is a vegan. He do a bunch of juicing. His body is chiseled. Do you hear what I'm saying? And he was actually able to heal himself just from being disciplined and saying, I'm going to change my life. So all that to say, sometimes God is telling us to turn away from certain things that have been toxic to us because he wants to use that way as a, a, a method of healing. Remember that the Bible says that with the tree of life, the leaves were used for the healing of the nations. There are, there's healing within plants. I'm just going to let y'all know that God created our bodies for that particular thing in the garden of Eden. That was the diet. That was actually the diet. Um, until after Noah and his family got off the boat and it's the diet that our bodies were created for in our bodies. If we know how to eat right, will thrive off of that. So for some of us, I'm just putting it, I'm just saying it because I feel led to say it. If God has been telling you, hey, stop doing this, stop eating that, start incorporating this thing into your life, then do it because he may be reversing things that have been done to you genetically from some of your careless, uh, you know, grandparents, parents or whatever. So anyhow, sin can... Um, sickness can be a direct result of sin. Either way, John 5 and 14, this is the man who he, Jesus went to. He said, do you want to be made whole? And the man said, listen, I'm going through this. I'm going through that. Nobody lets me in the water when the angels come to stir up the water. And so Jesus said, take up your bed and walk. And so then it says, afterward, Jesus found the man at the temple and said to him, listen to this. See, you have been made well. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. This is the these are the words of God himself. If you keep sinning, something worse may happen to you. You think that was a bad sickness? You've been laying there for how many years, not able to take care of yourself, just laying there begging, hoping that you get a handout? He says, I've healed you now. You've encountered me. But if you choose to keep sinning, something worse may happen to you. S uh, sickness can directly be linked to so many sins. Listen to this scripture. Listen to this. This is Psalm 38, one through 10. Listen to this. Oh Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. Your arrows have struck deep and your blows are, crush are crushing me. Listen to this. Listen to this next verse, y'all. Because of your anger, my whole body is sick. Do y'all hear this? My health is broken because of my sins. Y'all, somebody say something in the comment section. Somebody say something. I ain't gonna be able to see it right now, but somebody let me know that you hear. Somebody let me know that you just heard that scripture. If you think it was a myth, if you think this is something that, oh, because so many people will tell you, oh, no, we don't have to worry about that. We don't have to, you know, um, as it, no, you will get sick. 
sicknesses can be directly linked to some of our sinful behavior. And that's not limited to pre-Christianity. After we became Christians, if you did something that you ain't had no business doing, you could inherit a sickness if you don't know how to properly repent, if you don't know how to break those curses, if you don't know how to wash yourself with the blood, if you don't allow the blood to cleanse you with all unrighteousness. That's why Jesus says, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. Whatever the issue is, get rid of it. Get rid of it just that aggressively. Even if you felt like you needed that thing, listen, whatever it is that is causing an offense in your life, get rid of it. Because that thing can cause, as scripture says, the whole body is sick. My health is broken because of my sins. Listen to this. My guilt overwhelms me. It is a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. Listen, I am bent over and racked with pain. Some versions of this says my back is hurting and in pain, right? Or my back is hurting. Listen, all day long, I, walked around, I walk around filled with grief. What are that? That's mental disorder, orders. Like um, uh, depression, mental and emotional disorders, okay? Uh, what else does it say? A raven, a raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. I am exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. And he says that this is a result of his sins. And he says, listen, you know what I long for, Lord? You hear my every sigh. Listen, my heart beats wildly. My strength fails and I am going blind. If y'all don't believe me, that's Psalm 38. I just read verse 10. Verse 17 says, I am on the verge of collapse, facing constant pain, but I confess my sins. I am deeply sorry for what I have done. You can absolutely become sick, lose your strength, heart palpitations. They even have an AFib tracker on the Apple um, devices. Heart beating wildly. That is what that is. Um, AFib, when your heart rate is not right. And sometimes you have heart uh, accelerated heartbeats, sometimes you don't. Uh, your heart is beating wildly, your strength is failing you, you're, um, it says going blind and constant pain. How many, how many diseases we can think of today that people are on prescription medication for today that cause constant pain? That if they weren't on medication and treating themselves with different medications, they would be in constant pain. And all of that, he says, I'm, I'm, my, I'm bent over because of my back. I'm racked with pain in my back. How many people we know, including ourselves, have back pain that we can't get rid of? John 9 and 2, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, listen to this, this man or his parents that he was born blind? Sin can cause a person to be born with a disease or disability. And we got to check the question. He said the man was born blind, but did he sin, commit some type of offense at that age inside his mama? Or was it his parents' sins? Which one of this, which one of it, was it them or was it the parents that caused their child to be blind? But uh, he said it was neither. Let's go on. Proverbs 14 and 30. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Let me just say this. Anything that is trying to stress you out, anything that is trying to cause trauma, strife in your life, the blessings of the Lord make rich and addeth no sorrow with it. That scripture will not change. A peaceful heart leads to a healthy body. Anything that is trying to steal your peace can be, it can be very well said. That thing is trying to steal your health too. 
Okay. And then it goes on to say in Proverbs 14 and 30, jealousy is like cancer in the bones or rottenness in the bones, something that will eat away at the strength and the health of your bones. Do we know any diseases today like that? I'm sure we can name osteoporosis. Everybody don't get it. They try to normalize these things, different types of arthritis, things that are like rottenness in the bones. But that word is also um, translated as cancer. And then and a new living translation is translated as cancer. Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. How many children do we know? Or maybe we don't know them personally, or have we seen that actually have cancer? Or are born with rare types of cancer. And they, they can't find no healing. Can't nobody, nobody knows what to do about it. These things are a direct result of sin. Y'all do know that, right? This is a direct result of sin in so many of these cases. So sin can cause cancer and decay in the body. Job 5 and 2. For wrath killeth the foolish man and envy slayeth the silly one wrath you want to fight you want to curse people out you got to have the last words you got to go back and forth with people oh when i see leaders like that i stay away from them because automatically i know something wrong with your spirit something is not right when you out here arguing with folk going back and forth with people all running around telling everybody business and all that stuff i automatically can see that's wrath. God is not leading their mouth right now. I'm going to step right on back. Some things are too violent. Some things are just not right. I say, you know what? I'm going to leave that, that alone. Wrath kills the foolish man. Envy slayeth the silly one. You know what envy is. Jealousy. Wanting something um, that someone else has. Not being content with what you have and what God wants for your life. Listen, the sin of wrath or covetousness can cause death. Wrath killeth, it says, and envy slayeth. Okay? First Samuel 16 and 14. Now the spirit of the Lord had left Saul and the Lord sent a tormenting spirit that filled him with depression and fear. Why did he get this tormenting spirit of depression and of fear or anxiety the way it would be um, diagnosed today? Why, why did he get this? Because he rebelled against God. This is where before this, um, the Lord tells him rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Disobedience is like idolatry. Obedience is better than sacrifice. If you would have obeyed the Lord today, you and your entire family would have been blessed. But now since you've chosen to disobey the Lord, you and your family are going to be cut off and God is going to raise up someone else in your place. Rebellion, the sin of rebellion and the sin of disobedience resulted in depression and fear or anxiety. Proverbs 17 and 20, 22, a joyful heart is good medicine. That's why the Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You hold on to your joy. You don't allow the devil or this world to try to steal joy from you. Joy is a good medicine. It will heal you. If you know how to turn your heart away from depression, away from fear, anxiety, wrath, anger, strife, you will start feeling different in your body. And the Bible says, but a crushed spirit or a depressed spirit dries up the bones. What does that mean? Your, your strength is gone. Think about dry bones. You're in pain. Your strength is gone. How can you stand? How can you bear anything? Depression can lead to bone issues and disorders. Also, as it said that the bones dry up, um, this sin also can affect your strength. It's not just the bone disorders and issues. Um, it's also your strength. So what does that mean? Maybe you'll have hormonal imbalances or deficiencies in your body where you feel weakened. 
Okay. This can be directly connected to sin. It can be directly connected to sin. Ecclesiastes 7 and 9. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry. For anger lodges. That means it goes and it just it takes a trip. The, the demon of anger, it goes head on, it lodges, it it, it uh, sets up shop, it lives in the heart of fools. There are some things that need to be cast out of us. And then there are some things that need to be dislodged. What I've learned um, and come to the understanding of after doing deliverance and studying and things of that nature, that there are certain demons that lodge in certain body parts so that it can have its way with those body parts. There are demons that will lodge in your uterus, in your ovaries, in your heart, in your lungs, in your vaginal walls. In your, in your penis, there are demons that will lodge in specific areas of your body. Say something lodges in your uterus. Will it not have claims on what is produced inside of your uterus? Will it not have a deposit on that thing? These demons know what they're doing. But this scripture either way tells us that anger is going to attempt or it does lodge in the hearts of a fool. So listen. It says, don't become angry. Don't become quick in your spirit to be angry. Don't be a person who's of rage and known to fly off the handle because that sin can affect your heart. That sin can affect your heart. Daniel 4 and 27. So Daniel interprets a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. Um, and it was that he would essentially lose his mind and live like a wild animals for uh, animal for seven seasons. So if that's the four seasons that we know about, then that's about almost two years that he would live like a wild animal and lose his mind. And in light of this, Daniel counsels the king and he says, you know, you really should turn from your sins. Um, Daniel counsels this, the king to break off his sins and iniquities and practice righteousness. That's what Daniel says to him. He says, um, king, you know, be I hope it's not done to you like this, but this is what the dream means. And then Daniel says, break off your sins and your iniquities and practice righteousness. So listen to this. Uh, verse 27, it says, therefore, O king, king, let my counsel be accepted to acceptable to you. Break off your sins by practicing righteousness and your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. And what do we know happened to Nebuchadnezzar? He ended up losing his mind. His nails grew out like claws. He was out in the fields for almost two years eating grass. His servants left him. They kind of put it on a hush hush, didn't let everybody know. And when he got his mind back, he said, oh, wait, all the power belongs to Daniel's God. I know that now. So what happens? Sin can affect the mental health of a person. This happened to him as a direct result of his sin. That's why Daniel, after he told him this was going to happen, he says, break off your sins by practicing righteousness. Break off your iniquities by showing mercy to the oppressed. Watch how you treat people that there may perhaps be a lengthening of your prosperity. Maybe God, you know, if you start living right, maybe God will lengthen the prosperity of your life and not shorten it. This, this um, take two years away by causing you to lose your mind. Sin can affect the mental health of a person. Joe, so, you know, when we say, oh, I'm struggling with this sin. And, oh, you know, I just can't stop. And I just, listen, sin is attempting to destroy you slowly. Remember the Bible says sin is eager to control you. Job 15 and 20. It says the wicked man rifes in pain all his days. Through all the years that are laid up for the ruthless, sin causes pain in the body. Sin causes pain within the body. The Bible says that the wicked man writes in pain all of his days, um, all, um, through all of the days that are laid up for the ruthless. He's going to be in pain. He's going to struggle in some way in his physical body. First Samuel 25, 36 through 39 
Okay, so I'm going to give y'all just a little backstory. David asked Nabal for help during a low season in his life after he was kind to Nabal, his servants, after he was helpful um, to them and considerate to Nabal's workers. Uh, Nabal did not want to help David, saying that David's situation was not his problem. David says Nabal met his fate because he was insulting and did evil by not helping him. So it says, and Abigail came to Nabal, that's Abigail is Nabal's wife, and behold, he was holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, because this man was rich. He had enough to spare to help David and all his men. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. So she told him nothing at all until the morning. She said, you know what? He's having fun. He's in a good mood. So not, I'm not even going to tell him that David was about to come out here and kill him. And I went on ahead and, um, you know, brought a whole bunch of food and a whole bunch of things to drink to David and the people who were with him. So I'm not even going to tell him until the morning light. It says in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him and he became as a stone. And about 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord who has avenged the insult I received at the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from wrongdoing. Why? Because vengeance belongs to the Lord. Because David said, I'm about to get him. It's not going to be one thing left that pisseth against the wall when I'm done with him. So he says, you know what? He kept me from doing wrong because I was about to let him have it. But you know what? He blessed me. He gave me what I wanted. And then he took care of him. The Lord has returned the evil of Nabal on his head. What does this mean? Sin can bring stroke because that's what that meant when his heart died within him and he became as a stone. That's what that was. Or, you know, that's what it is believed to have been in paralysis. You know how a stroke can sometimes paralyze someone. So it says his heart died within him and he became as a, a stone. So his evil, his sin caused stroke, paralysis or sudden death. Let's see, 1 Samuel 15 and 13. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. We know that this is what um, the Lord said to Saul. We found out, you know, a little while ago, what happened to Saul, he received a tormenting spirit of depression and fear or anxiety. Exodus 22 and 18, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. So if you have been rebellious and rebellion is on the same level as witchcraft and you shall not suffer a witch to live, then what happens? Rebellion and stubbornness have the same consequences as witchcraft and idolatry. Did not Saul and his family end up dead prematurely and in a dishonorable way? Weren't their heads cut off, put up on display? Sin has some dire consequences. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft because when you rebel against God, you are literally stepping outside of what is right and you are finding other means of accomplishing whatever it is that you want. Means that are outside of the will of God, means that are outside of the spirit of God that are not involved with God. This is why it's on the same level as witchcraft. Stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols because if God is telling you to do something and you are stubborn and you say, I'm going to worship my own mind or uh, worshiping idols, um, stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. When you're stubborn, you say, I'm going to follow my own way. I know what God is saying, but I'm not going to do that. I'm worshiping my own mind, my own desires, my own intellect. And it's compared to idolatry when you're a stubborn person, when you refuse to do what God is telling you to do, when you act in rebellion and you absolutely just find your own way of doing things. It's like you're being a witch because that's what they do. <sighs> okay, so we're going to talk about how to receive glory to God. Y'all, we almost, we're almost done. Okay.
So we're going to talk about how to begin to receive healing and to break curses of sickness. Proverbs 3, 7 and 8, it says, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Listen to this. Fear God. Don't lean to your own understanding. You know, some of us want to do what we want to do, how we want to do it. God done told us to do one thing, but we want to do this whenever we feel like we want to do it. It says, be not wise in your own eyes. That's stubbornness. That's you being wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Because if you truly fear the Lord, you're not going to follow what you think. You're going to follow what God says and turn away from evil. Listen to what, what, what it will bring you. This will bring healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. The word of God is clear. Sin causes sickness, obedience to God, yielding to his will for your life in every area will bring healing to your body and those dried up, decaying, cancerous bones and it will they will be refreshed. Come on, I hope we're writing this down. I hope we are writing this down. Like y'all, this may, y'all may need to watch the replay to get all these scriptures in these points, okay? Because this to me, this is deep. Because like the Bible says in the last days because of sin, because of iniquity, because of lawlessness, it will be so widespread that the love of many will wax cold. But what we see is that this increase of sin and this increase of sickness, this increase of lawlessness and this increase of sickness. If y'all write in, I'm thirsty. So good. Thank you, Jesus. Okay. Okay. The amplified version of verse eight says, if you, you know, obey the Lord, it will be health to your body. Listen to this, your marrow, your nerves, this, your sinew, your muscles, all your inner parts and refreshment, physical well-being to your bones. Proverbs 4 and 20 through 22. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ears to my saying. This is the father speaking to his children. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them from within your heart. Keep them, excuse me, within your heart. Not from within your heart. Keep them within your heart. So we understand as New Testament believers now, this is how we said, this is the Lord talking to us. Because we're not actually, you know, Solomon or anything like that um, being taught by David. Okay. <laughs> Um, and it says, let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart. Why? For they are life to those who find them. Listen to this and healing to all their flesh. Listen to what God is saying. Be attentive to his words. Pay attention to his words. Incline your ears to what God says. Don't allow them to escape from you. It says from your sight. So what does that mean? Now you're, something else has your attention. Something else has your vision. So he says, be attentive to my words. Don't let them escape from your sight. Keep them in your heart for they are life to those who find them. Sin is death for people. The word of God will be life for you if you have found it and if you listen to it. And then it says in healing to all their flesh. Proverbs 11 and 21, be assured an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Let me tell you something. Sin brings violence and immorality into the bloodline, but the righteous, their offspring will be delivered from those type of things. It's so imperative that we know how to bring our children up in the Lord so that they don't have to go through any consequences of sin. Because sin, I tell y'all, is not just something that we do. It's a principality. It's a ruler. It's a throne. It's a dominion. It's an entity. It thinks. It reigns. It deceives. In Hebrews, it says, uh, it talks about the deceptiveness of sin. It's subtle. Be careful to raise your children up the right way. 
Exodus 34, six through seven. Then the Lord passed in front of Moses and called out the Lord, the Lord God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving devotion and faithfulness, maintaining loving devotion to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. He will visit the iniquity of the fathers on their children and grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Exodus 34 and 14, for you must not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4 and 24, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 5, 8 through 10, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods in anything that you turn to serve um, that you become a slave to. It can be drugs. It can be uh, the opposite sex. It can be this thing or the next that you make a God in your life. He says, I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations of those who love me and obey my commands. What does it say in Deuteronomy 28? He says, if you do not obey all the commands and decrees that I'm giving you, all these curses will come and overwhelm you. Not just poverty, but he says, curses, confusion, frustration in everything that you do until at last you are completely destroyed for doing evil and abandoning me. It's not a light thing to sin. It's not a light thing to give into temptation and to sin. That's not a light thing. It says the Lord will afflict you with diseases until none of you are left in the land that you are about to enter and occupy. The Lord will strike you with wasting diseases, fevers, and inflammation. Come on, y'all. How many inflammatory diseases are there today? With scorching heat and drought and with blight and mildew, these disasters will pursue you until you die. Let's see. Let's go on. You'll be defeated by your enemies. The Lord will afflict you with boils, with tumors, scurvy, the itch, which we understand to be eczema from which you cannot be cured. The Lord will strike you with blindness, madness, and panic. What we understand, what do you think? Uh, PTSD, uh, panic attacks, anxiety attacks, madness, schizophrenia, snapping. How many people, how many murders have we seen where somebody kill themselves, kill the whole family and kill themselves? Madness. You will grope around in broad daylight like a blind person groping in the darkness, but you won't find your way. You will be oppressed. And um, man, this is just no joke. It's just no joke. He says, I will cover you with boils. Uh, you will receive tumors. You will become a horror and a mockery. How many times have we seen people turn to false gods for healing? And sadly, they get healed when they're supposed to turn to saints. But guess what? Christians are walking around not even fighting against having to be on medication. Not even trying to uphold that our God is a healer. Come on, y'all. Come on. We have to send people and I have nothing against doctors. Doctors are fine. I, I used to feel like, oh my goodness, we should. But you know what? Everybody got to do what they have to do. I have no problem with doctors at all. But as Christians, knowing the results of sin, knowing the power of Jesus Christ in his blood, we should fight to have curses, covenants, contracts, and vows broken. Stop putting things into our bodies that we know are carcinogens and that's causing that type of harm because we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow. So we have to come into the knowledge that when we come to Christ through him and the power that's in him, 
now we have the right to live free of curses and things like that. But there's so many spiritual legalities and agreements that we have to be um, intentional about breaking specific curses, especially if we have seen oppression in our families or if we feel we may have some oppression within ourselves. God has more for his people than that. Jesus came to set the captives free. He came to proclaim sight to the blind. Come on, y'all. He came so that we would have healing. Healing is the children's bread. It's for us. So we have to do what we need to do to live in that abundant life, that more abundant life that Jesus has for us. Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for opening our eyes. Thank you for giving us insight, understanding, and revelation about how plain your word is, about how you don't hide things from us, Lord God. You said the things that are revealed to us are for us and for our children. You don't just want us to know this. You want everyone in our generations and our bloodline to know this, that there's healing in life with when we obey you. But if we choose to disobey you and live in sin, there is sickness and there is death. Help us, God, to come out of agreement with whatever we had came into agreement with in our lifetime that could work against your will for us. In the name of Jesus, heal us from the things that our family and our ancestors have gone through in Jesus' name. Even for people who are sick right now, Father, I pray that you're bringing insight and revelation to them, Lord Jesus, and that they begin to receive their healing by faith, by obeying your word. Hallelujah. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We seal up this message with the blood of Jesus. We look forward to tomorrow, Lord God. Amen. Amen and amen. Glory to God. I'm going to turn down this light because it's really bright in my face. I'm going to turn it up a little bit so y'all can still see me. Lord Jesus, tell me that's not something. Tell me that's not something. It just breaks your heart because there are so many people, so many Christians who are struggling today. Man, so many are struggling today. <sighs> and we have no idea. I am going to, pardon me, y'all put up, you know, I, I like to see the comments. <sighs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Y'all, it's so many comments that I don't know where I would begin, but just God bless y'all. I'm glad that y'all were engaged. This is no joke. And um, everybody turns to the Lord. I remember seeing Derek Prince talk about someone who was sick, um, terminal with cancer, right? And they heard him teaching about how when he was sick and doctors could do nothing else for him, he said that he saw in the word that if you read the word, it's healing to your navel and it's life to your bones, right? One of the scriptures that I probably read. And he said, so he began to read the word since the word would bring healing. He said, I've read it three times a day for breakfast, lunch and dinner. Since it's healing to the navel, like, you know, he was ingesting it and he be, and he was healed. And he said, this lady who was terminal, she did it and she was healed. Can you imagine the power of faith? Glory to the name of the Lord and just obeying God, just obeying him. Glory to God, just obeying his word. There's so much liberty in Christ Jesus. And I just thank the Lord for this lesson. I thank him for enlightening his people. I thank him for wanting us to be healed. Glory to God. Hey, Tiffany Brown. I'm happy that you're on here. So God bless you all. I love you all. And Lord willing, we will be back here. 730 Central Standard Time tomorrow. Good night, everybody.